Alrighty, good evening. This is strange seeing you guys. Like, I'm gonna have to like keep doing this because you're so far apart from each other. But it's good to be here. Happy Wednesday. I had to prep myself to say that because in my mind I want to say happy Sabbath, but we're not there yet. So happy Wednesday. Thank you all for being here. I ask that you may be with me and that you may pray with me uh, and for me as I present this topic. Uh, as it's a difficult one, especially in the time that we're living in right now, it has been um, stressful being a person of, of color and having to answer all types of questions all the time uh, because of everything that's going on. Uh, but I'm happy to be here with you and to share or, or speak a little bit on um, this issue, a little bit of research that I've done um, before. Um, let's pray before we dive into the subject here tonight. Father in heaven, I thank you so much that we are here today. Um, despite everything that's going on in the world right now, um, we're truly blessed to be able to have a space, uh, a safe space that we can come and we can worship and we can study your word. I ask that you may be with me as I present this topic and that the uh, the words that I speak will not be my own, but will be yours. Thank you for blessing us. In your name I pray. Amen. So, the title on the screen is, might have made you a little uncomfortable, but hey, we're living in a time of very uncomfortable things. So, uh, the title of this talk is A Racist Religion. The Bible has been deemed a misogynistic, a uh, megalomaniacal, sexist, and homophobic book. But within the past 400 years of American history, it has also uh, been considered to be the root cause of racism, social segregation, and ethnic cleansing. Not only has the, uh, America been the sole culprit of misusing scripture to further the evil ideologies of racism and, and whatnot, uh, but we see this throughout history and throughout the world as people use the Bible, the word of God, to promote heinous activities. Today, as I said, the topic is a racist religion. Bill Meyer, or Mayer, said Old Testament is really one of the most wickedest books you'll ever come across. God is an insecure, rage-filled hybrid of Bobby Knight and Suge Knight. He's got these anger issues that you can't believe. He's pro-slavery, he's pro-polygamy, and he's homophobic. Dan Savage, who is a um, journalist and a LGBTQIA plus activist, also said this. He said, the Bible is radically pro-slavery. Slave owners waved Bibles over their heads during the Civil War and justified it. Now, Dan Savage is, is right about half of what he said. The first part, not so much, but the second part, for, for, for sure, uh, slave owners did wave the Bible over their heads to promote the institution of slavery. John Saffin, for example, was a poet, merchant, politician, and judge who penned a pro-slavery uh, defense after his colleague Samuel Sewell, a businessman, had shockingly stated that the sons of Adam have equal right to liberty and all comforts of life. Shockingly, John Saffin was, was dismayed by this statement, and he he did a, a defense to that and said, God set different orders and degrees of men in the world. It is no evil thing to bring, to, to, it's no evil thing to bring them out of their own heathenness country to where they may have the knowledge of the one true God be converted and eternally saved. Uh, he believed that in the act of slavery, he was saving the black race. He also said this, that part was a little bit, you know, it wasn't, that, it wasn't that crazy racist, right? So he said this, cowardly and cruel, right after that, he said, cowardly and cruel are those blacks innate, prone to revenge, imp of inveterate hate. He that exasperates them soon espises mischief and murder in their eyes, libidousness, deceitful, false, and rude, the spume issues of ingratitude. He followed by saying, we may keep bond men and use them in our services still, yet with all candor and moderation and Christian prudence, accordance to their states and condition, con con 
consonant to the word of God. The reason why I wanted to show you the quotes from John Saffin in relation to what Dan Savage said about the Bible being pro-slavery pro, uh, pro and how uh, slave owners waved their Bibles over their heads as they, as they promoted slavery was because it's true. Now, if we use the, the historical context, we would be like, okay, maybe the Bible is pro-slavery. So today, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at a few things. We're going to look at, is the Bible pro-slavery? Is the Bible racist? And is the church, the SDA church, is it racist? Does it have that history as well? So is the Bible pro-slavery? Most of you would be like, no. But let's dive in and try to figure out why or why the uh, American slave owners were wrong. The Bible never condones involuntary servitude. In Exodus 21, verse 16, it says, anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death, whether the victim has been sold or is still in the kidnapper's possession. In 1 Timothy, it says, we also know that the law is made not for the righteous, but for lawbreakers and rebels, the ungodly and sinful, the unholy and irreligious, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for sexually immoral, for those practicing homosexuality, for slave traders and liars and perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine. In this, we're seeing that slave trade is put up with the other sins, some serious sins, people that killed their mother or their father or things like that, it's put up there. So slavery is not necessarily something that is smiled upon in the Bible. Deuteronomy 24 verse 7 says, if a man is found stealing one of his brothers of the people of Israel, and if he treats him as a slave or sells him, then that thief shall die. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. And of course, there's the Bible verse in the New Testament, because we obviously assume Oh, the Old Testament, obviously, it has all this crazy stuff in it. Well, the New Testament was also used oftentimes to promote slavery as well, and especially this verse, Ephesians 6, verse 5. It says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear, and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. In this verse, people assume that, well, he's saying slaves obey your masters therefore slavery must be okay hmm, great logic but the word slave here is better translated in the greek as bond servant so the the works we're going to discuss more about what a bond servant is versus a slave or american slavery person that they owed a debt to leviticus 25 verse 44 to 46 says as for your male and female slaves whom you may have you may buy male and female slaves from among the nations that are around you. You may also buy from among the strangers who sojourn with you and their clans that are with you who have been born in your land and they may be your property. You may bequeath them to your sons after you to inherit as a, as, as a possession forever. You may make slaves of them, but over your brothers, the, the people of Israel, you shall not rule one over another ruthlessly. So here we see Leviticus um, uh, in, in Leviticus, we're seeing proof that the Hebrews were allowed to buy slaves. Um, and again, this was another idea that in early America, buying slaves or taking slaves from Africa was okay because, hey, well, the Bible says in Leviticus, we can buy slaves. Um, and again, while the Bible sets up a system where you can have slaves or servants, a better word would be, uh, it's, it's, it gives space for that, but it also gives regulation for it. Um, the Jews who were slaves themselves were held to a higher standard uh, of slavery than the surrounding nations that were around them. Genesis 17, verse 12, sorry, we're going to go home to that one. But the slaves, they had rights, and these were some of the rights of the slaves. The first being slaves must be treated as full members of the community. In Genesis 17, verse 12, it says, For the generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in, the, in your household or those bought with money from a foreigner, those who are not your offspring. So in that, they were the slaves that were purchased or whatever from outside, from other foreign countries. They were required to be a part of their religious community as well. 
So they have to follow the ordinances of the religious community, which, again, is not, is not helping the argument necessarily because in American slavery, Christianity was uh, given to the slaves. So this would be in accordance to what they were doing. But there's more to the rights that slaves had. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. So in Ephesians 6, verse 9, we see that, uh, that there is no difference between the master and the slave. Their worth is equivalent to God. So there's no difference between the two of them. Whereas in American slavery, the master, which who was white, would be above the black slave, which would mean that their worth was more important, that their status was more important, that them as a person was more important. <clears throat> Colossians 4 verse 1 says, Masters, provide your slaves with what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. So again, the New Testament is promoting fairness for the slaves, for their servants at the time. So again, there's the, the, the allowance for slaves, but here are the regulations that they had to abide by. Another rights of the slaves was that slaves must have the same rest periods and holidays as non-slaves. So that means that slaves were given holidays or given time off, or they had to follow what was going on in the Hebraic uh, calendar as well. So Deuteronomy 5 verse 14, we all know this one, but the seventh day is the day of the Sabbath, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. So slaves were given the, the opportunity of rest, something that was not practiced in American slavery. And there was a little rest, but it wasn't that much. Um, <clears throat> another thing was that slaves must be treated humanely and with respect. Exodus uh, 21, verse 26 to 27 says, an owner who hits a male or female slave in the eye and destroys it must let the slave go free to compensate for the eye. And an owner who knocks out the tooth of a male or female servant must let the slave go free to compensate for the tooth. So in other words, that the slaves had the rights to sue their masters. They had the rights to, to be protected by the law. Um, and as we see in American slavery, black African Americans were not considered to be protected under that law. They weren't protect, protected under the Constitution uh, because they weren't considered men. And of course, as we said before, uh, slaves were to be set free after six years. These were Hebrew slaves. And after they had done their debt, um, paid their debt in the six years or whatnot, they were to be set free. Uh, most of American slaves spent their entire lives in slavery, their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, everyone was a slave. There was no leaving it <clears throat> unless you ran from it. <laughs> So American slavery versus biblical slavery, millions of slaves were captured, sold, or kidnapped during the transatlantic slave trade. In Exodus 21, verse, verse uh, 16, it says, whoever steals a man again and sells him, and anyone who finds in possession of him shall be put to death. So the act of stealing uh, a man was in violation of the biblical form of slavery. 17 million slaves were killed during the transatlantic slave trade, as in just leaving the continent of Africa to go to America, 17 million people died in between that. This here is <clears throat> what an African uh, slave trade boat would look like to a certain extent. Um, as the artist tried to portray, there's no space. There's nowhere to move, there's nowhere to wiggle, no personal space, right? And that's why a lot of slaves died in, the, uh, the, in, in this traveling, because it was, it, was, it was not clean, it was dirty, and there was a lot of disease and things like that. Uh, Oladu Equiano, this gentleman here, published an autobiography in 1789 called The Interesting Narrative of the Life of Oladu Equiano. Uh, and he says in it, and in, uh, when he reflects on his travels from, uh, from Africa to America, he writes, the stench of the hold while we were on the coast was so intolerable and so intolerably loathsome that it was dangerous to remain there for any time. This produced a copious perspiration from a variety of loathsome smells 
and brought on a sickness among the slaves of which many died. So even just the smell was killing people in that boat. He also talks about the fact that, well, nobody could use the facilities. They had to do it right there and then. Um, he talked about how children would fall into basins of, you know, and die because they suffocated. He talked about how disgusting and how horrible the slave trade itself was from getting on the boat to going to America. And that's why there was 17 million, and that number is debated, um, 17 million slaves that were killed uh, during transport to America. And of course, American slavery was brutal. An estimated 30 million to 60 million, again, some say 100 million Africans died while being enslaved. Leviticus 25 verse three says, you shall not rule over him ruthlessly, but shall fear your God. So this brutalizing of, of, of African slaves, again, was totally out of context of what the word of God had said and was not in accordance to what, the, what God had said, uh, uh, what the parameters for servanthood or slavery would be. And you might ask, well, Elijah, why didn't God just say, thou shalt not have slaves? Um, why not just write that in the Bible? Why not get rid of that? Well, the time period that the Hebrews were coming out of, Israel, uh, out of Egypt was a severely slave society. Like everyone had slaves at the time. And God, God knowing that man is weak and dumb, uh, he knew that we, they, he would need to give them certain parameters because they would eventually fall into the practice of, of slavery and servanthood. So he gave them those parameters. So we see this a lot in the Bible where he gives a trajectory of truth where he says, okay, you're allowed to do this right now, but I'm not going to let you do it later on. And he leads people on that, 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 that revelation of truth. Of course, in, in, in the Old Testament, all the way at the beginning, slavery had its parameters. But now, it's not something that God wants us to have or God wants us to do. So the following section is the Bible races. Now, slavery <clears throat> and racism is talked about hand in hand in this country, obviously, because in order to have such a horrible portion of history, you would have to have severe racism, right? You couldn't look at another human being and do that to them without actually thinking in your head that they're not a human being. So racism, is the Bible racist? Now the Huffington Post said this, unfortunately the Bible is not very helpful when it comes to race issues. Many have found within its pages justification for slavery, abuse of African Americans, and segregation. Unfortunately, the divisions between the races are exacerbated not diminished by Christianity. Now, also GQ published a list of books that you shouldn't read, and one of them was the Bible because it's sexist and yada, 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 and it's all that stuff, right? So, of course, there's this discussion because we've seen people in history, um, like John Safin, who, who openly writes a paper about why it's the Christian thing to do to have slaves. We see that throughout history, why uh, Christians stood and, 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 and promoted segregation. Christians stood and, and promoted uh, all types of different things. This, I mean, this country was a Christian country, right? So it would make sense that a lot of the Christians, professed Christians, would use the Bible to, uh, to promote a, a horrible idea. So... <clears throat> Before we go any further, I'd like to define racism. The reason why I want to define racism is because I feel like we throw the term around all the time. Racism is, as defined here, a belief that a race is the primary, primary determinant of human traits and capacities, and that a racial difference produces an inherent superiority of, particu of a particular race. So it's not about me just not liking you, it's me not liking you because of the features that you have. And then, because I don't like you, I also believe that you're less than me. And then, because I believe you're less than me, I can create a system that, is, uh, uh, that can oppress you, hence like slavery. So slavery is a direct result of racism. <clears throat> Again, now as I said before, the Bible kind of gives way for a, uh, the Bible gives a, a, 
a parameters for slavery, but we do not see that with racism. There's nowhere in the Bible that racism is okay. There's nowhere in the Bible where there's like it's a Greek word or a Hebrew word and like we just misinterpreted it or something. No, there's nothing in the Bible that promotes racism. <clears throat> Skeptics have said that the Bible is racist because the Jews are God's chosen people. These are things that you can actually find online. People say, well, the Bible's racist. They, God chose the Jews to be you know, a, a special people. So that means that the Bible's racist because everyone is special. Well, let's see. So there's, first of all, the lineage of Jesus. The reason why the Jews were chosen was because the lineage of Jesus was, because Jesus was supposed to come out of that nation, right? Jesus was supposed to be a product of the children of Israel and not necessarily because they had some sort of physical traits, but because God had given them a message to share. Uh, Genesis 12, I don't, one, to, 1, 2, and 3 uh, says this here. It says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So when God blessed Abraham, blessed this nation, this group of people, he wasn't necessarily favoring them. He was giving them a job. And their job was to do what? To bless other nations with the message that he had given them. So in fact, there are the... the the problem was not that, and we see that in the Bible, is that you know, the Jews had a hard time understanding the fact that this gospel or this message that they had was not just for them. It was for everyone else. But they missed the boat. They misunderstood. They didn't understand that they were supposed to do this. In Psalms 51, verse 11 to, <clears throat> 11 to 13, Uh, in Psalms 51, 11 to 13, it says, Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way, and sinners shall be converted. In other words, like the, this was before the Great Commission was written, to teach. That's what the Hebrews were supposed to do. They were supposed to teach other nations about, about their God. But they missed the boat. They misunderstood. They didn't, they didn't get the full picture that this was not to be a singular thing. It was supposed to be for everyone. <clears throat> Another discussion that's brought up in, uh, from skeptics and whatnot and, is that Ham's descendants are cursed. Now, um, if you read a little bit about this, People believe that Ham's descendants are people that look like, look like myself. They're the darker skin toned people from Africa, right? So Ham's descendants are cursed. And we get this idea from, remember, Noah and that whole situation, and then he cursed uh, them. And so people assume that, well, Ham's people are cursed. That's why there's slavery. And actually, this was actually used as an argument for pro-slavery. They were like, OK, well, the Bible said these people, they're cursed, so let's get rid of Let's make them slaves. Let's make them servants, as, as we want them to do. Uh, Genesis 9, verse 25. So this is the whole situation where, you know, Noah and his sons, and uh, Ham sees his dad, and they get it, and he doesn't do anything about it, and kind of thing. And then Noah, like, curses him. And he says, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. So this verse has been used for the pro-slavery argument, for the, even, even the pro-racism argument to segregate, to do this thing, because they're like, hey, well, Ham's descendants, who are the black population of this country or whatever, they're cursed, according to the Bible. Therefore, and it says, they should be servants Therefore, we should have slavery. Therefore, we should segregate. Therefore, we should have racism and all these things, right? 
But that doesn't make sense, because nowhere in that does it say Ham is cursed. What does it say? Cursed be Canaan. So here we have, uh, uh, if we look at Genesis 10, verse 8, if you scroll down a little bit, it says, where am I? Sorry, not 10, verse 8, 10, verse 6, it says, the sons of Ham were Cush, Misram, Put, and Canaan. So Ham, even if this was a valid argument to say that Ham was cursed and that the entire black population comes from Ham, even if this argument was valid, it does not say all of Ham's descendants would be cursed. It says Canaan would be cursed. Canaan specifically is cursed. And we see this fulfillment of prophecy when they come out of, you know, uh, uh, come out of Egypt and they, you know, they're going through Canaan and all that stuff is happening and we see what happens to, 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 to Canaan at that time. So nowhere does it say that the black descendants are to be servants or they should be slaves because the Bible tells them that they're cursed. As a matter of fact, Zephaniah 3 verse 10 <clears throat> says, from beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, my scattered people will bring me offerings. So here we're seeing in Africa, Kush, that's where that's located, you know, near Egypt and whatnot. And this is where, this is the black population giving or, or worshiping God and doing these things. So no, they weren't cursed. Not the whole continent of Africa was cursed, but there were even in uh, Noah's descendants, worshipers of the one true God. There's also Psalm 68, verse 31. Envoys will come from Egypt. Cush will submit herself to God. So we're seeing, again, that the Bible is talking about Africa or, or portion of Africa being uh, uh, servants of, of God, not servants of man, servants of God and worshiping the one true God. So this, this idea that Ham is the, you know, he's the, the, the cursed one and Shem and Jepheth, they, you know, they got it made because Ham's supposed to serve them. That's, that's a ludicrous idea. It's not true. It doesn't, it's not biblical. So that argument, as well as the dividing of, of races, people believe that, well, this idea of the three races comes from the Bible, which in fact it does not. The idea of Japheth, Shem, and Ham is, is not to say that there are three races. What, what were were all three of these people humans? I, I think they were all humans, right? And they all came from one fa father? Oh, okay, okay, interesting. So that doesn't even make sense. <clears throat> However, what uh, skeptics and atheists and atheists who believe in evolution and things like that, they love to point out the Bible and its racism, but forget to point out that Darwinism is a sole contributor to racism. Hugely, uh, uh, Darwin promoted racism and he, he influenced eugenics and things like that. This model here is extremely racist. He has the, the Negro type or the Negroid and the Mongoloid and the Caucasian in the middle there. And he discusses that the Negroid, the Negroid is the lowest of the evolutionary spectrum because, well, the Negro looks like an ape. I mean, how much more racist can you get? Darwin here splits up, and it's interesting how it's three things. So he, he, he splits it up in three ways, uh, and, and I, I feel like that's where we try to make, we try to attach the Bible narrative of Ham, Sham, and Jepheth to this. And I think that's where the danger came, is when we tried to do that, and then we had this evolutionary model, and then people promoted racism through it. It makes no sense. It's not true. So if anything, the, the Bible itself does not promote a race category or a race system or a class system here, but evolution does. The final thing we're going to look at here is, is the church racist? Now, is the Seventh-day Adventist church racist more specifically is what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about the pioneers and we're talking about our history here. <clears throat> Ellen White well, first, was there racial tensions in the early church? So let's look at this. Was there racial tensions in the early church? Now, to be clear, the Adventist church has a lot of humans in it, which means 
that there's a lot of trouble sometimes. So uh, was there racial tensions in the early SDA church? It says, sin rests upon us as a church because we have not made greater effort for the salvation of souls among the colored people. You have no license from God, no license from God to exclude the colored people from your places of worship. Treat them as Christ's property, which they are. Just as much as yourselves, they should hold membership in the church with the white brethren. Every effort should be made to wipe out the terrible wrong which has been done to them. This is from the Southern Work. This is Ellen White speaking here, and she's writing about a problem that's in our church, in the early church, for some reason, and she's frustrated. If you read, how many of you read the Southern Work? Ah, this is, this is very typical. Uh, the Southern Work, I only recently read it. I actually only recently heard about the book. Uh, you know, I've heard about Conflict of Ages, Testimonies of Church, all of them, read those things, but never read this book. I encourage you to read this book. This book, Ellen Wright starts off by talking about how controversial it is. Soon after she discusses these race things, she's off to Australia. Don't know if that's a coincidence, but she wrote this book in, 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 in response to everything that was going on. She was frustrated. If you, you could hear the, the frustration in her words as she's writing these things and imploring the white population of our church at the time to just get it together. What are you doing? <laughs> And a lot of our, our early pioneers were doing that as well. Now, there are some problematic um, portions here, but let's read this quote first. It says, I have a most earnest interest in the work to be done among the colored people. This is a branch of work that has been strangely neglected. The reason that this large class of human beings who have souls to save or to lose have been so neglected is the prejudice that white people have felt and manifested after mingling with them in religious worship. <clears throat> they have been despised, shunned, treated with abhorrence as though crime were upon them. When they were helpless and in need, when men should have labored most earnestly for their salvation, they have been treated without pity. The priests and the Levites have looked upon their wretchedness and have passed by on the other side. Again, Ellen White, and, and this is not just, and this is, this is one of the beautiful things about the founding of our church, because if, I don't know if y'all realize, is that our church was founded during one of the most uh, racially tense, one of the most politically charged periods in American history. That is when our church popped out. And we could have had leaders that were pro-slavery or pro-racist things, and that did happen. There were church, church founders of other organizations that were not as open as, and as progressive as our church leaders, and this is beautiful to see that. <clears throat> now, based on this, you would assume that Ellen White is not racist. You would assume that, but people have pick and choose a few portions of her writings and have said, well, because of this, She's racist, we're gonna look at a couple right now. This one, <clears throat> she says, opportunities are con continually presenting themselves in the southern states and many wise Christian colored men will be called to the work, but for several reasons, white men must be chosen as leaders. Whoa, that's a lot. That's, that's, that's a triggered statement right there, isn't it? Now, okay, we're gonna get, we're gonna, let's read another one, let's read another one. <laughs> we're gonna get, I'll come back to that. So she also says, uh, another quote that I found that people had a problem with and were like, whoa, that's a, li that's a little bit racist, Sister White. Uh, that's a little racist, Auntie Ellen. So she, uh, she also says this, but there is an objection to marriage of the white race with black. All should consider that they have no right to entail upon their offspring that which will place them at a disadvantage. They have no right to give them a give them as a birthright a condition which would subject them to a life of humiliation. The children of these mixed marriages have a feeling of bitterness toward the parents who have given them this lifelong inheritance. For this reason, if there were no other, there should be no intermarriage between whites and the colored race. Now, this is an important thing to, to discuss right now because I've actually heard of people utilizing this quote for now. They're like, oh, Sister White said it, therefore, 
no interracial marriages. No, no, no. It's not a, it's just white said it's a no. But just like even with the word of God, we have to look at things contextually, right? We have to look at things with a historical context, with the, the context of the situation that she was speaking into. We don't just pick out a verse and try to make it to prove our point. That's what the slaveholders did. They found a verse and were like, yeah, this is the verse that says we can have slaves. Well, the same thing we can't do with Ellen White because she, just like many, just like how people pick and choose with the Bible, she's been picking and people have picked and choose with her and tried to develop crazy ideas. Ellen White was writing in the post-Civil War era, era when she was writing these things. So after, you know, after the Civil War and all that, so you would assume, you know, of course, after the Civil War, you know, everyone fought, lots of blood, all that stuff. We were all fine, happy, rainbows, all of that. Everything was back to normal, back to as it should be. Well, no, we all know history and we all know that after the Civil War, it was not any better. It, it, well, in the fact that slaves were free, that was better, but we were still dealing with severe, severe racial tensions. <clears throat> this map here is a, uh, is a lynch map. Um, and basically lynching was the murder of people, a group of people murdered by mob usually. Um, and these dots here, each dot, I can't remember how much each dot represents, but it goes through uh, uh, the time period here at the bottom you can see. Um, <clears throat> The, the orange is blacks, Af African Americans. Those are the Amer African Americans that were, were lynched during that period, 1882, all the way to 1863 and 84-ish. Uh, the yellow is Latin America, so uh, Latinos and, and whatnot. Um, so anyone that were Latino, and that makes sense because we see the more um, the border states where more Latinos would obviously be. So there was more lynchings of Latinos. And then of course there's a speckle of blue, which is Italian, a little speckle of green, which is others. So that'd be other people. A lynching was caused mostly uh, by people that were like, okay, let's take the law into our own hands. So for example, if a black man, and this happened many times, if a black man was accused of raping a a white girl or committing some crime, uh, they would go out, find the, the black man, and, and they, would, they, they would kill him. Um, and usually that was through hanging or things like that. <clears throat> and I can go further into detail about that, but I'm not going to. But this was the time period that Ellen White is writing, and obviously she's not pro-segregation or things like that. She was, when she wrote originally, she's talking about how the fact y'all need to let them be a part of the church. They need to worship with you. They need to do these things with you. But because of the attitude, because of the American angst at that time and the struggle for, um, for racial justice at that time, preaching the gospel as a black preacher to white people would have killed you. That would have killed you immediately. So that's why in the previous verse he says, well, there are black uh, preachers that need to, to, to preach, and she explains in the Southern work that, hey, for now, you guys need to go and preach to your people, because otherwise, you're going to die, and that will just defeat the whole purpose. We need you alive. Uh, the same thing with whites. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, with the whole idea of intermarriage inter, uh, inter, uh, between cultures, uh, between the two races, um, that was not looked upon nicely, because guess what? Both would, would be lynched. The, the black person that was with the white person and the white person that was with the black person and potentially the child, if they got the chance to, co to live, the child would be lynched as well too. So the time period, of course, was extremely volatile. Ellen White did not, and just like how God allowed slavery and, and certain parameters of slavery in the Old Testament, the same thing happened here, whereas Ellen White severely wanted there to be integration to, for the blacks and the whites to work together to, to, pr to promote the gospel, but because of the hardness of these people's hearts, because of the sin that was happening, it's, it was just, it was almost impossible to do. Um, we're gonna look at another thing here. This is, of course, this was, this was established one year after the civil rights 
the Ku Klux Klan one year after the civil rights, and, and boom, here we have this weird Christian organization, apparently, uh, that pops up, and, 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 and they're out to, to cause a ruckus and to prevent the integration of blacks and whites and things like that. So Ellen White's seeing all of this unfold. She's seeing everything happening, uh, everything happen and, and going on. Also, Jim Crow. That happened in the 1896, separate but equal, you know, by the, the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, <clears throat> a lot of people in, in our church, and this is one of the things that she fought against. She's like, well, why are we doing this segregation thing that y'all want to do? Why are you doing this? <laughs> why do you want to do this? And even uh, within our church, we had segregated churches and, and schools like that, and, and it was very difficult for, for blacks and whites to come together even within our church. We, 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 are, we are not immune to these things. <clears throat> Edson, um, her son, Edson White, um, many of you might know his story. He was one of the pioneers in reaching the African-American community. He took it upon himself. He, his mother was talking about it all the time. We need to reach the, the, the African-American community. We're not doing it. Y'all aren't doing it. So he said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do it. And he did it. Um, and he went out on a boat, went down south, and started preaching to African Americans, regardless of the fact that he could die. This is a letter that he wrote to them. He said, two weeks ago tonight, a mob about 25 white men came to our church at Calmer at about midnight. They brought out Brother Stevenson, our worker, then looted the church, burning books, maps, charts, etc. They hunted for Brother Casey, our leading colored brother of that place. But he had escaped in time, so they did not reach him. They, went, they then went to the house of Brother Alvin, called him out, and whipped him with a cow whip, a cow hide. I think they would have killed him if it had not been for a friendly white man who ordered them to stop whipping after they had struck a flu blows. They did not pay attention to him the first time, but he drew his revolver and said that the next, the next man who struck a blow would hear from him. And then they stopped. During this time, they shot at Brother Elvin's wife and struck her in the leg, but did not hurt her seriously. They took Brother Stevenson to the nearest railway, put him, in, put him on the cars, and sent him out of the, the country. They posted a notice on our church forbidding me to return, forbidding the, street, the steamer, the Morning Star, which was the boat that he used, to land between Yazoo City and Vicksburg. The whole difficulty arose from our effort to aid the colored people. We had given them clothing were in need and food to those who were hungry and taught them some better ideas about farming, introducing different seeds uh, such as peanuts, beans that bring a high price. And these, the whites would not stand. They, were, <laughs> they weren't even, Edson White didn't even mention the fact that they were just trying to preach the gospel. He was trying to just help people that were in need. He was just trying to provide a service towards African Americans in that time, and they were not having it. They were not having it. And that was the time period that, that um, Edson White, Ellen White, many of our pioneers are living through and seeing this, this volatile America that is just bent on, on not having blacks or anything move forward. <clears throat> so, I hope that makes sense. But my question is, what about now? Are racial tensions and prejudices, prejudiceness still a problem today? Is this a non-issue today? Um, and obviously, we're, we're discussing this all the time. We're discussing race and things like that, what's going on right now. Um, things aren't as, as crazy as when Edson White was trying to, to reach the African-American population, obviously. Uh, things aren't like that right now. but. Um, but we're, we, we are having this conversation because of what, 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 what we're looking at right now. So one thing that um, Martin Luther King said, which is interesting, he said this. One of the tragedies of our nation, one of the shameful tragedies at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is one of the most segregated hours, if not the most segregated hours in Christian America. So Martin Luther said that, you know, 50 plus years ago. And he said that the, one of the most segregated hours in, in American time is, is Sunday. 
um, um, at 11 o'clock. He's saying church service. Uh, and that's just one of the things that, our, uh, that Ellen White was pushing for was this idea to, to stop segregating, to stop this idea that, that we need to not worship together. Um, the Christian church in America, uh, about 5 to 7.5% of the Christian church in America still is segregated. At the top part there, you'll see the Adventist church. And it says it's the most diverse church in in America right now. It's the fastest growing church, and it's the most diverse church in America right now. So amen to that. Um, but we see here we have about 37% whites in, Amer uh, in our church and 32% um, black. So that's a very, very even, almost even split there. So we're seeing that there, that there isn't this huge segregation as there used to be necessarily. Um, there's a diversity that's increased in our country, and I believe it has to do a lot with the work of Edson White and whatnot, and all that stuff that he did, and Ellen White and how she pushed forward it. I think that it's taken us a while to get to this point. And historically, we did have race, major racial tensions in our church. We did have, unfortunately, uh, segregation and things like that, and, and, and it wasn't, I believe that, I truly believe if more people read the Southern work throughout the hundred years between you know, her death and whatnot, the Adventist church would be flying ahead. It would be so ahead. We would be leading. <laughs> we would not be following in regards to this issue. And I think that right now we're in this point in history and we are asking ourselves, like, what's going on? Is there racial tensions? Is there this and that? Uh, and uh, you know, race, racism and things like that is a result of sin. And if racism is a result of sin, racism will always exist, unfortunately. Um, but what are we doing as a church? What are we doing uh, for our people? Galatians 3, verse 28 says, There is neither, y'all know this one, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One, not three, <laughs> not the, you know, the, the black, the Asian, and the white. No, it's one in Christ. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved just the white folk. No. For God so loved just the black folk. Mm -mm. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Christ did not die for one group of people. He didn't die for one special elevated species of man. <laughs> he died for the human race, and that's what we, we are today. This is what we must realize is that we're not separated by races, by colors, or we should not be. Even though that the world is looking like that right now, we have to be, as a church, one people. My question is, when you think of a racist religion, or a racist church, you might think of that picture. You might think, oh, okay, yeah, a racist, racist religion, bunch of people with weird costumes on, looking like clowns, I don't know. But in this picture here, we have that weird thing where we have these super, this racist institution, and above it, Jesus saves. And this is the racist religion that you might have in mind, but I'd petition that that's not necessarily what a racist religion always looks like. Race and religion could look like this, or maybe it could look something like this instead. My point being is that when you neglect your brother, when you neglect your sister, or when you neglect those that are hurting, or those that are in need, or those that are different from you, that is a racist religion. When you forget that other people have pains, and you focus on yourself, when you think of only the great theology that the Adventist church has and, and forget that there are people that are suffering, that is a racist religion. That is just as bad as the KKK. When you neglect your brother, when you walk on the wayside, when you pass them by, that is a racist religion. Charles Spurgeon, this is my favorite quote from Charles Spurgeon. He said, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies, and if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, 
let it be filled in the teeth of our exertion and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. There is no way that you can call yourself a Christian and neglect or see the, uh, or, or neglect people that are around you, neglect people that are different from you, neglect people that don't act like you, don't talk like you, don't sound like you, don't eat like you, don't smell like you, neglecting those people and forgetting to pray for them or share the gospel for them or doing whatever it takes to make sure that they are saved, that is a racist religion. From the Southern work, Christ says, I mean, Ellen White says, Christ worked throughout his life to break down this prejudice. No human power alone could overcome it. This prejudice was created not by mere flesh and blood, but by principalities and powers. And in wrestling against it, he was wrestling against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirituality, against spiritual wickedness in high places. He's talking here about the Gentiles and the Jews and how he broke down that prejudiceness. And he wasn't doing it because he was just doing it. He was fighting against the greatest evil in the world. Desire of Ages says, the only hope of redemption for our fallen race, the human race, is in Christ. You know, I think that one of the greatest things that we could learn from the um, history of the black history and, and slavery and the African-American struggle up in, is, is that it doesn't make sense for African-Americans to be Christian. I mean, looking at history, let's be honest here, the men that were giving them the gospel were beating them, chaining them, whipping them, murdering them, hurting them, killing them. Who in their right mind would worship the God of that. You know, I think sometimes we give too much credit to people for sharing the gospel to the African American because it does not make it makes no sense that they would fall in love with a savior of these people, of of of, of people that were oppressing them. It makes no sense. But somehow, and I believe 100% that it was the Holy Spirit that led African Americans to, to Jesus, that, led, that had slaves singing songs of a savior. They didn't see Christ in their oppressor. They saw Christ in their pain. And I think that is the most beautiful story that could ever be told. That's the most beautiful thing that could ever be spoken of, is that they didn't find Christ through the people that were giving it to them necessarily, but they found Christ in their pain. And that's why they sing songs of it. That's why they joined the church. That's why they preached about it. That's why they wrote poems about it, was because they fell in love with Christ, because only in him is hope of redemption. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we have had to, to dive into your word and to look at a little bit of some hard themes. Father, I ask that you may be with us as a people that you may change our hearts, that you may remove any prejudiceness that we might have to one another, to our brothers, our sisters, to whoever it is, that you would break down the walls, the barriers, the, the things that are keeping us from reaching people. Father, I ask that you may help us to focus on you and to realize that the only hope that we have is through you. I thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. I thank you so much for the words that you have given us. In your name I pray, amen.